Uh, I would like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Jana Chekhanovic. Please, uh, Jana, uh, she teaches at the Department uh, of Archaeology at the Ben Gurion University of the Negev. She is an archaeologist uh, specialized in the late antiquity, Caucasian Christian community of Byzantine Palestine, archaeology of pilgrimage. After her long-term work in Jerusalem, with a very extensive list of publications, Yana is now leading archaeological expedition at Nitsana in Negev, and focused on the material evidence of early Christian pilgrimage there. Among her publication, I would like to uh, mention in particular, of course, uh, uh, quite uh, recently uh, published a book about uh, Caucasian 2018, Caucasian Archaeology on the Holy Land, authoritative study, the most authoritative study on this topic. Not, I think today, Armenian, Georgian, and Albanian communities between the 4th and 11th centuries CE. Her final publication reports of her uh, joint excavations with Doron Benami at Givati Park in Lot uh, in Jerusalem. And uh, just, uh, I think, last year, it appeared in, in Russian, yeah, but... I can read Russian, so it's okay. Uh, uh, but I assume it's going to be translated about Russian uh, excavations by the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, sources, discussion, and modern interpretation. So, uh, Yana, please, Yana will uh, speak about Byzantine pilgrimage to the Holy Land, new insights from archaeological excavations in Jerusalem and surroundings. Um, thank you, Alex. Um, I have to add to the previous lecture and the Mesopotamian, uh, Mesopotamian traces. Apparently, inside the Banias caves, there is also an upper Paleolithic site, so probably, yeah, yeah, that's the word of our prehistorians, and probably the uh, pilgrimage to the site started already <coughs> then. Uh, thank you very much for this invitation. Uh, so, let's start. Uh, the phenomenon of um, early Christian pilgrimage to the holy places of ancient Palestine uh, was exceptional, both in its scope and its cosmopolitic character. During the Byzantine period, Jerusalem finally turns into a religious center of the major part of the world, and local Greek and Aramaic-speaking population meets pilgrims flowing from all the corners of the growing Christian Oikumene to see, to touch, and to experience the holy places. Many pilgrims <coughs> choose to stay for years or even for life. Their activity in the Byzantine holy city is well attested by literary sources, and we spoke about them yesterday and we'll sp speak more today. Historical chronicles, uh, geographic works, pilgrims, uh, itineraries, and private letters. The sources are not really overlapping the material evidence. Most of the texts are dated to a relatively early period, while the archaeological data is mainly reflecting rather a later period of Byzantine rule and beyond it. The material evidence of pilgrimage is naturally concentrated in and around Jerusalem. It was indeed the heart of the Byzantine Holy Land, but it's also the most excavated and well-studied region of the country. The constantly growing archaeological discoveries related to Christian pilgrimage were mainly uh, results of salvage excavations prompted by intense development of the city and they include a great variety of finds. Um, for example, architecture of monastic complexes with some unusual structural arrangements and uh, space divisions, such as living quarters, uh, bathing facilities, especially large water reservoirs, enormously large number of uh, ceramic vessels, big kitchens and refectories, and even funeral arrangements for bypassing pilgrims, just in case that someone will be lucky enough to die during the journey. And also the small finds, the pilgrims' graffiti or other inscriptions 
in exotic scripts and all kinds of portable blessings and souvenirs. Within the city, after the construction of the Holy Sepulchre uh, and other important primary sites, the constantly growing flow of pilgrims leads to establishment of numerous hospices and even entire pilgrimage neighborhoods located to the west and to the north of the city walls. The Roman city, Ele Capitolina, wasn't built to accept that many visitors, and uh, the pilgrims' accommodations of the Byzantine period were provided already in the new extramural quarters. Such pilgrimage quarter was exposed by the archaeologist of Israel Antiquities Authority to the north of the city wall in a series of salvage excavations that started in the 1990s and uh, didn't finish up to this day. Uh, generations of uh, archaeologists of Jerusalem took part in the partial exposure of this pilgrimage quarter. It is a large agglomeration of various ecclesiastical institutions, the largest of this kind in Jerusalem, by the way, not mentioned by any literary source. Altogether, at least four different monasteries were discovered here with residential units that served local monks and pilgrims with churches, bathhouses, water cisterns, uh, various household units and tombs. Mind this odd elongated shape of the exposed area. That is because salvage excavations were performed for the development of the light rail in the city, not because it was originally planned in this way. The discovered epigraphic finds give a possibility to speak of the imperial patronage of this project. This uh, inscription, this one, yeah. Uh, this inscription uh, is uh, the second Byzantine uh, Justinian inscription that was discovered uh, since ever the archaeological excavations start in the city. Of course, uh, Jerusalem, despite its extreme holiness, was not the only large pilgrimage center of the Byzantine world. Let us remember the important sites uh, created out of nothing, like Kalat Simun in Syria and uh, Abu Mina in Egypt, once attracting the amazing crowds and developing into true cities. The formation of Christian Jerusalem appears to be a long and multi-stage process that significantly changed the appearance of the city, its main arteria and its focal points. The pilgrims' hospices and ceremonial routes were key to the development of the Christian topography of the city. And in this regard, we should mention a very important research done a few years ago by Michele Voltaggio on liturgical streets of Jerusalem, combining the literary evidence with archaeological data and presenting a totally new understanding of the urban development of the holy city and uh, minding this um, new concept of liturgical streets in Jerusalem. If we will look outside the city, we will find out that the ancient Roman uh, roads are keeping functioning and now serving a new purpose. This uh, Byzantine road stations uh, mostly established already by the Roman authorities along the main roads leading to Jerusalem. Uh, let's just demonstrate a few examples. This one is Churvat el Latatin on the Jerusalem Lidder Road, uh, one of the 20 road stations marked on the Madaba map, according to the excavator. Uh, nine mile from the holy city, arranged as a caravansarai, small one, but housing a monastery with a small chapel and some agricultural facilities. And this one is Beit Nekofa road station on the Jerusalem Jaffa road, modern highway Jerusalem Tel Aviv, uh, partly excavated a few years ago 
just yesterday. So they are building something here very fast uh, with a chapel and even with a small baptistry font. I would say a very enigmatic find because it's not entirely clear who's supposed to be baptized in this font on the way to Jerusalem. Someone who is already on the way or someone who is on the way back and why baptistry in this pilgrimage station. Perhaps we are not aware of certain pilgrimage traditions or ceremonies performed during the journey and this is just one of many questions that deserve its own attention and study. Some of these uh, modest road stations are turning by the time into large ecclesiastical site pilgrimage by passing by. Of a special interest is a network of pilgrimage churches and monasteries along the roads of Judean Shfila, a hilled region between Jerusalem and Tel Aviv, previously not starring in the Christian archaeology of the Holy Land. Numerous Shfila sites exposed in the last decades are illustrating the instrumental role of this region in the development of the pilgrimage routes connecting Jerusalem to the holy places to its south. To mention the, this marvelous and quickly vandalized complex uh, excavated at Horvat Midras and recently exposed and already covered the Church of the Glorious Martyr with uh, lavish mosaics and uh, archaeological evidence of continuous pilgrimage to the site far into early Islamic period, presented by hundreds of Abbasid period oil <coughs> lamps of the late 8th, 9th century, discovered in the church crypt. And here I'm coming back to the question um, discussed 10 minutes ago about the mutual holy sites. It's not for pagan worship, but it's very hard for us to say uh, archaeological evidence does not give us possibility to conclude who were the people lighting their lamps in the crypt of the church that was already abandoned. Were they Christians who kept to coming to the site um, after the church was already laying in ruins, or were they Muslims who continued the tradition <coughs> of its veneration? At least for this specific case, we know about much later, modern times, Palestinian Muslim veneration of the site and some sacred well, apparently based uh, also on Byzantine uh, tradition. Few more uh, pilgrimage spots with a long durée history are known today. One of them is being re-excavated in these very days. It's also located in the Shvila region not far away from Tel Lachish, uh, so-called Salome Cave, apparently uh, a monumental family tomb from the early Roman period that turns to venerated site in Christian times, uh, full of graffiti inscriptions, and now we, uh, according to the same Abbasid lamps, can say that also here, in this case, the pilgrimage to the site continues well far into the uh, early Islamic period. Uh, of a special value for study of pilgrimage, of course, uh, are the epigraphic evidences. The graffiti left by pilgrims at the holy site and elsewhere. Just a few examples uh, presented here are the Armenian graffiti discovered in salvage excavations in Jerusalem in the southern and western parts of the city with names and uh, uh, pleas for divine mercy, very common for this uh, type of, of texts. It's hard to imagine that somebody will uh, start an academic excavation uh, followed by interested to pilgrims graffiti, so most of them were discovered in a salvage excavation context. Sometimes the inscriptions are quite long. The longest and most original from the known early examples are the Armenian graffiti. I couldn't resist, even it was found 
far away from Jerusalem, uh, on the side of the Sinai road to Santa Catarina Monastery. Uh, this wonderful and long Armenian inscription says, uh, God have a mercy on a camel and the guide. And uh, this one, also Armenian, is my favorite, a drawing of the cross and the beginning of inscription, I saw Jer Jerusalem. And then something stopped him or her, probably him, from writing. They call him back, camel and the guide, and he continued his journey. But that's one of the rare cases when the graffiti inscription can say us something about the direction of the movement of the pilgrims. He already was in Jerusalem. He visited the holy city, and now he's on the way to Sinai, but he remembers that something that struck his car. Um, sometimes there were no words at all, just crosses. Yen, this one is for you. Uh, Non-verbal non graffiti. Uh, from the recent excavations of Adi Erlich and Ron Lavi in Banias. This uh, stone is covered by dozens of engraved crosses, and those uh, medieval crosses from the Nativity Church in Bethlehem, but we have them all over the holy places. One, it was thought that uh, the crosses graffiti has to do something with literacy, or unliteracy, and uh, there are some kind of later, perhaps medieval appearance, but now we know that also during the Byzantine period that was a common practice. Nothing is written there, just crosses. Um, among the discoveries are also figurative graffiti, and the most famous and probably one of the most ancient, is known already since 1970s. It's a boat from the foundations of the Holy Supplica Church, discovered in the Armenian uh, chapel of St. Vartan. Um, a very interesting find was discovered recently in the renewed excavations at the Davidson Center, Ophel, uh, Ophel area, um, at the footsteps of the Temple Mount, Haram Sharif. Um, I'm not sure that you can see well this composition scratched on the preparatory layer of plaster within a large water channel. A very unusual context to find a graffiti. Why we think that it's related to the pilgrimage? Because we can see here, I can see, uh, nearly a dozen of human figures. One is standing on the boat. Here is a boat, and here is a figure, and uh, many more surrounding him, some in Oran's position, most of them, uh, perhaps, as it was proposed, a visual illustration to one of the gospel scenes or something of a kind. Definitely we are talking about people in prayer. But uh, I have to say that to study these finds, one needs to be not just an archaeologist or art historian, but to use the tool set of folklorists, specialist on uh, how they used to call it before, naive art or primitive art. Uh, look at this wonderful figurative graffiti that my workers draw on the uh, container with the tools. One of the excavation to Jerusalem, I guess you can easily recognize the holy site. Can you recognize it? It's Dome of the Rock. And people flowing into it. Friday prayer. I think it's wonderful. Illustration of, um, of the attitude that had to be a little bit changed in order to understand and to, uh, to analyze this kind of finds uh, properly. The material markers of the pilgrimage from far lands include uh, isolated finds produced outside the limits of the Holy Land. Every time we find something like this, we can be sure that it's not just uh, marketing, but it's a pilgrimage marketing. Uh, for example, this uh, pilgrim Ampula from Ephesus or other Asia Minor site, probably lost by a pilgrim in his long journey. It was discovered in a pilgrimage quarter to the west 
of the city walls in Jerusalem. So someone went to Ephesus or other Asian city and then came back to Jerusalem or just came to Jerusalem or brought it with him. Uh, we have some fragments of Coptic painted uh, ware also discovered in the city. And most exotic, uh, fourth century coins from Aksum, the first coins minted with a cross symbol, discovered at two Byzantine sites in Jerusalem. Uh, this um, miniature carved bone box with two painted icons inside it, discovered at one of the Byzantine liturgical streets of Jerusalem, and also served as a pilgrimage eulogia. Such a pocket edition icons are extremely rare. Only two parallels are known. One of them found on the main street uh, in Gerasa, Jarash, in Jordan. Uh, Uzi, I'm happy to inform you that next week it will be finally exposed uh, in the vitrines of Israel Museum. Uh, from the same site, the Givati parking lot, comes this uh, pilgrimage bronze ring discovered in the Umayyad context. We can see here a scene of mere barriers by the empty tomb of Christ greeted by an angel. Perhaps the ring is supposed to remind to his owner of his sacred journey and of the miracle of resurrection. Similar rings are numerous, but were previously known from private collections. This one from Givati parking lot is the first one discovered in archaeological context. Quite amazing, this tiny object of the 7th century is already reproducing the classical iconography of this scene, so well known to us from the best works of Western and Eastern art. And this brings us back to the old scientific discussion regarding the meaning of pilgrimage art, or in other words, the role of Palestinian realia transferred into the very far corners of Christendom by pilgrims who actually saw the holy places. A great research work uh, was done during the last hundred years in in studying of Western exemplars of this transfer of the sacred images. And now the time has come to introduce the research dealing with the East. For example, the models of the Holy Tomb discovered in Georgia, Armenia, and the Black Sea region. Recently, few important articles on the subject were published, finally in English, discussing the role of pilgrimage art for the development for the development of the Christian iconography of the East and uh, shedding new light on this material. It is not always easy to understand the purpose and use of some of these artifacts related to pilgrimage. It seems that sometimes we have to search for medieval or even modern parallels to these pilgrimage objects showing, apparently, an astonishing conservatism. In general, the ethno-archaeological perspective on ancient pilgrimage can be, perhaps, one of the fruitful approaches to this subject. And using this approach, we may learn that practically every stone, every branch, and even every fish taken out from the waters of the Sea of Galilee can become a blessing, a vlogia, once it is taken away from the Holy Land. The archaeology of Christian pilgrimage is a new field for Israel. Hopefully, this uh, brief review will contribute to our discussion on certain categories of finds, and in broader sense, on the pilgrimage customs of the past, one of the key features of mobility in ancient Palestine. Thank you. We'll stay with the fish. Yeah, thank you very much, Jana. Uh, I recall that uh, I visited the Salome Cave uh, before the excavations, and uh, inside I saw the uh, pictures of young uh, Tsarevich uh, Alexei. Uh, it's still there. It's still there? Okay, <laughs> even after the excavations. 
So the site is still visited. Even still during the excavations, still prior to excavations, modern pilgrims somehow discover, discover it alone. And they are visiting yeah, Russian icons with Tsarevich, uh, yeah. definitely. The martyr, yeah, official, yeah, official yeah. martyr. Here is your martyr. Exactly, here is the martyr. Uh, so please, uh, any questions to Yana? Hi, no, that was good. That was uh, that was great. Um, I uh, excuse me. Uh, I, you said the crosses were for me, and I thought the uh, that's that the pilgrimage symbols are really are really fascinating. I, I can't remember seeing uh, crosses before. Uh, did you you didn't mention? Uh, did you find any the two? Did you find any feet? Uh, you know, images of feet. Uh, that's one question, and the, the the other thing that comes to mind is, I, I'm always curious about. Uh, I don't know what the word for it is, but people scraping things off. You find little holes where people have dug out part of the, the structure. Do you find any evidence for that? And do you know what I could what I could cite on on that? I probably have other questions too. I will start on the last one. If we are talking about archaeological context or ancient road with rocks around where something is written. It's very hard to catch this uh, scraps, scratches, and finds like that. But look, please look at the um, picture in the middle. Those are mosaics scrapped out of Hagia Sophia. And there are many more pieces. Uh, something is from uh, Greece, something is from Jerusalem. I heard myself, the Russian dance from the Mount of Olives, discussing the miracle of multiplication of ancient mosaics in certain place uh, on their property. They keep taking it as a souvenirs, and mosaics are still multiplicating. So I think, yes. I'm sorry that uh, I, um, we use that many modern examples, but the pilgrimage is... Um, is uh, well, the institutional established part of the story we know from Egeria, from uh, serious texts, but the private life of these people that we are trying to catch is absolutely invisible. So I really think that um, using the modern observances on pilgrimage, we can learn much and to understand many things. Uh, what about the feet? The feet? Feet? Images of feet. Images of feet we, we have plenty starting from the medieval, medieval period on. In Byzantine period, I guess we see these feet on the mosaics, a pair of sandals, a pair of feet. Any more questions? No. Sorry. Um, thank you. I, I watched uh, your lecture online on my on my way here. <laughs> uh, actually, it's a question to both of you because I've been struggling with this a bit. Um, do you have evidence for professionals writing graffiti for pilgrims? Um, uh, <coughs> Uh, well, I don't, I don't really have much. I, I think they did in Egypt. I mean, the, 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 I know the evidence from Greco-Roman Egypt reasonably well, and I think it's pretty clear that they, they must have done uh, because, partly because people use the same formulas uh, in, uh, in, in, in writing. I can think of from the best, from the best graffiti at Abydos, for example, there are there are cases where quite a complex formula is used, and then with, with names attached. So I'm sure that's the case, uh, but I can't actually think of. And I can imagine how that could have been institutionalised. You would pay someone to do it for you. I'm sure there are many other examples as well. Uh, I think the example of the pagan pilgrimage inscription from Panias that uh, you brought. Uh, is definitely performed by someone skilled, some uh, stone mason. Uh, 
For example, those cross graffiti, the medieval graffiti, especially typical for Armenian churches, uh, we see plenty of them, hundreds of them, in the Holy Sepulchre, when you are going down to St. Helena Chapel, or in Bethlehem, you can see that the crosses are done by the same hand. Besides, it's very difficult to imagine that someone would allow the Armenians to come with hammers and chisel and to, to start to draw their crosses whenever they like uh, in, in the church. So it's definitely, uh, I can say, we, we, we can say it for sure nowadays that those uh, typical standard crosses are definitely done by someone who was paid or prayed for. But, yeah. Um, thanks, Yana. I have a question about the, the place of the pilgrimage to Jerusalem within the larger kind of network of, of Christian pilgrimage, and perhaps in particular with regard to the Negev. I mean, how, how do we imagine, did, did they come for a kind of a longer tour? How, how did Jerusalem figure in these kind of overall um, journeys? Are, are there differences between the different Christian communities that, that you look at? I was trying to be modest and not to start to discuss my new excavations at Nisana, but I see that it's unavoidable. Uh, well, Shefila Road leads us to the south and then to Santa Catarina. Uh, please remember that uh, Jerusalem was accessed uh, mainly, well, perhaps mainly by sea, and the main port of the Byzantine pilgrimage was not Caesarea, but Alexandria. So the southern road, uh, yeah, in certain ways, even more important than the road uh, via Syria and so on. Uh, so this um, negative churches were some sort of missing link in our evidence, and uh, relatively the new uh, the new discoveries and the new excavations and new studies in the southern region uh, are giving us some new insights on various issues, including pilgrimage. Now, uh, with epigraphic evidence, it's a very difficult story, because if you see something written in Greek, you would never be sure who actually wrote it. Maybe some local Christian uh, priest, or someone who was sweeping the floor in the church. That's why the Armenian and Georgian evidence any other exotic language would fit, but there is not. Uh, so Armenian and Georgian evidences are that important because if we see a graffiti in Armenian or Georgian in some Shifta or Nisana, we can be pretty sure that these people were not living there. That's probably one of the explanations to this multiple churches of the Byzantine period in the negative settlements. Too many churches. Um, were they built simultaneously or were overlapping? It's uh, pretty hard to say because most of the uh, buildings were excavated a long time ago and were not enough published. Um, and um, architecturally, all belong to the same type of classical Byzantine basilica. And um, on my opinion, there is no possibility to say that this one belonged to monophysitic group and this one is pure orthodox, and so on. So it's still a subject under study. Uh, in continuation to, uh, to your question, I would extend this network to the coast. Maybe it's a, you know, the fact that I'm excavating in Azotos uh, somehow influences me, but of course these coastal cities with the normal... Caesarea. Azotos, forget about Caesarea, <laughs> Ascalon. If from Alexandria, they stop there, they sail and they stop and they start walking. Also, for, these are the ports of coal. So this landscape is we don't really have enough amazing data. pilgrimage. We don't have enough data. Uh, Jerusalem is the most studied also in everything related to early Christian pilgrimage. Okay, thank you for this uh, wonderful presentation as usual. Uh, and I have a, a general uh, between a comment and a question, because the, you, you've shown all the evidence for a, a, a pilgrimage, movement, a visiting, the leftovers, the graffiti, the, the infrastructure. 
uh, that was uh, created for uh, pilgrims. And at the same time, at least for sure in Jerusalem, we have this stage when the pilgrims uh, settle and become immigrants. And the, 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 the general question that came to my mind is, can we define uh, in archaeology the, the uh, dividing line or the stage when uh, this pilgrims' quarter uh, have been created? It couldn't have been created without pilgrims. At a, but at a certain stage, it become part of the city, and not only a, a kind of uh, a, a place where uh, pilgrims uh, reside for a few days. So, can you uh, say something about this uh, contact point between? I think it was a very interesting, very cosmopolitic, and very special community. All they call themselves, uh, we know from the sources, that we, the dwellers of the Holy Land. Yeah. It's not something of the kind uh, that we see today in the Holy Supplicate Church. This is Greek, this is Catholic, this is Armenian, this is Coptic. No, it was uh, some sort of brotherhood um, that was, most of it, was, uh, were foreigners. They were foreigners. It's very interesting. Uh, people are coming, and in some uh, geographic works, we read the text like that, he came and he visited the holy sites and then he stayed seven years in the cave in the Judean desert near Mar Saba monastery. Or he stayed 17 years in the cave until the Virgin Mary did not appear in front of him and didn't tell him go home. Yeah, Some people stay, most of them stay. Uh, perhaps uh, it's a bias of my research, but I have a feeling that most of the of the people running this uh, local Christian community were foreigners, or at least their names we learn from the, from the sources. Um, regarding the pilgrimage quarter, uh, well, we know at least of its Armenian segment. There is an Armenian monastery excavated by uh, David Amit in 1990s that it was established sometime in the fifth century, and it probably has something to do with St. Stephen complex uh, developed nearby. Uh, we have already fifth century tomb with Armenian inscription in the crypt of this monastery. Monks are not reproducing themselves, and uh, pilgrims are coming, and most of them are going. and. Uh, the question of how, how, how they became local is a little bit uh, complicated uh, because, uh, because uh, those who stay supposed to stay, to stay in some mon monastic grounds. Um, what I was going to say, I forgot. Anyway, it's complicated, Gideon. <laughs> We don't have we don't have any national communities in of Georgians or Armenians or Copts. We don't have these communities in uh, Byzantine Palestine and Jerusalem, especially. We do have some national monasteries in a relatively late stage, but no lay communities. Any more questions? Just uh, before we conclude, uh, I forgot I uh, wanted to, to tell you about your uh, question about this enigmatic baptisterium. Uh, recall uh, St. Philip that he meets an uh, Ethiopian eunuch on his way, on the road, and he was on the way to Gaza before he was taken by Holy Spirit. And he and, continued and chanting. He, bapti he baptized him on the road, so you never know whom you're going to meet on the road. That's... Uh, <laughs> Uh, so I, I'm perfectly fine with this baptisterium. So thank you very much for thank this uh, very successful uh, session. Thank you, Jana.